Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston, and welcome to Lecture 2 of Introductory Linear Algebra. In our previous lecture, we started learning about vectors, which we thought of either as ordered pairs of numbers or arrows in two-dimensional space. In this lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to look at vectors in higher dimensions. We're going to look at vectors with more than two entries, or vectors that we have to represent in three or more dimensions rather than just two-dimensional space. Okay, so let's start off with the three-dimensional case. Okay, and the point is there's really nothing special about 2D. Okay, there's no reason that when we list out entries of vectors, we have to stop after two entries, and there's no reason that we only have to work with arrows in two-dimensional space. Okay, these higher dimensions, they exist even if they're harder to visualize. Okay, so let's, let's think about how this works in three-dimensional space. Well, when we're talking about 3D vectors, what we mean is an ordered triple of numbers, okay? So something like 1, 3, 2, okay? The first entry is 1, the second entry is 3, and the third entry is 2. And again, ordered matters in vectors, no matter how many dimensions it has, okay? So we really mean those three numbers in that order, okay? Well, what does this look like geometrically? Well, again, vectors geometrically, they're arrows representing motion or displacement, okay? But this time, because there are three entries, it's an arrow in three-dimensional space, okay? So I'm not actually going to draw these things by hand, okay? Drawing by hand in three-dimensional space, I mean, I suck at it. Some people can do it, fine. Um, I don't, and I'm not going to expect you to in this course, but you do at least need to be able to read drawings of three-dimensional vectors, okay? So in the textbook, for example, there are drawings like this, and you have to know what this drawing means, okay? So for the vector 1, 3, 2, what this means is this vector goes a distance of 1 in the x direction, then a distance of 3 in the y direction, and then a distance of 2 in the z direction. Okay, and exactly what the x direction and y direction and z direction are is a little bit arbitrary. Like usually we have the z direction going up and down. Okay, but that's just convention. And then the x and y direction, they're just two perpendicular directions to the up-down direction. But I mean, there's no completely standard agreed upon convention for where x is and where y is. In the textbook, I draw them like this with x usually coming down to the front left and y coming down to the front right. Okay, so if it goes one unit in the x direction, well then, okay, you go along the x axis, just a distance of one unit. And then you go along the y axis, a distance of three units. And then you go along the z axis, in other words, up, a distance of two units. Okay, and then that's our vector. It's the vector that points sort of to that outer, outer corner of that rectangular prism box that has side lengths one and three and two. Okay. So that's what it is geometrically. It's a little bit harder to picture, but hopefully we understand what it means. Um, algebraically, though, really, really nothing changes. All that happens is you have more numbers, but you do all the same things to them, okay? So remember we talked about how to add and scale and multiply vectors in two-dimensional space in the previous lecture. Well, all that works the exact same in three-dimensional space, okay, with vectors with three entries. Okay, so if you want to add vectors with three entries, you still just do it entry-wise, okay? So v1, v2, v3 plus w1, w2, w3 is, well, v1 plus w1, you add the first entries, and then v2 plus w2, you add the second entries, and v3 plus w3, you add the third entries, okay? So you just do what you would kind of hope you do. You just do things entry-wise, okay? And this still has the geometric interpretation of, you know, this sum vector is what you get if you follow along this first vector and then follow along that second vector, right? You follow along the first arrow, then follow along the second arrow. Ah, that gives you sort of the big long arrow going from the start of the first to the end of the second. Okay, and scalar multiplication's the same, okay? So for scalar multiplication, if you wanna multiply a vector with three entries by a scalar, just do what you would expect, okay? Multiply that scalar in to each of the entries. So you do CV1 time, and then CV2 and CV3. Okay? And again, this has the same geometric interpretation. You're just taking that arrow, that vector in three-dimensional space, and you're stretching it by that scalar C. Okay? So again, like the interpretation is the exact same as it was in two-dimensional space. So in a sense, there's nothing new here. It's just there's a third entry, whereas before there were only two. Okay, well, we can go even farther than this. Okay, Again, like the dimension really doesn't matter. Nothing that we said there was special. 
to three. Like there was no reason that we had to restrict ourselves to three entries. So there's nothing special about three dimensional space either. Okay, all of these ideas, they extend naturally to four dimensions and five dimensions and so on. Okay, you might be a little uneasy with this at first because we live in three dimensional space, but as far as the math is concerned, that's completely irrelevant. You can do all of the same math in any number of dimensions. Okay, so there's nothing special about three dimensional space. Okay, so we say that it, you know, a vector in n dimensions, it's an ordered n tuple, okay? So they're just n numbers and order matters, okay? So here, this vector that I've listed, the first entry is one and the second entry is two and so on up to the nth entry is n. Okay, and that's a vector in n dimensional space. So we would represent that via an arrow that we draw in n dimensional space. So how do we do that? We don't do that, okay? I mean, like in two dimensional space, we can draw things. In three dimensional space, we can sort of draw things. In four and five and six and higher dimensions, uh, I'm not gonna try to draw things. I mean, there, there may be a couple ways that you can wrangle a little bit of information out of a drawing, but in my opinion, it's not terribly enlightening, so it's not something that we're gonna do, okay? So the geometric interpretation breaks down a little bit. Hopefully the intuition that you get from geometry, though, still helps you, okay? So geometrically, this doesn't, vectors don't necessarily, you know, tell us a whole lot anymore, but algebraically they're gonna work the exact same, okay? Algebraically, you can do all the same stuff that you could do with 2D and 3D vectors, you can do them with vectors in arbitrary numbers of dimensions. So for example, okay, so for example, if you wanna add vectors that have n entries, well, you can do it exactly how you might hope, okay? You just take the first vector and then add them entry-wise to the entries of the second vector, right? So the first, first entry is gonna be the first entry of V plus the first entry of W, and that's the first entry of V plus W, okay? And then if you do V2 plus W2, that gives you the second entry of their sum, and so on. You just do it entry-wise, just like you did in two and three dimensions. Okay, and same thing with scalar multiplication, okay? If you want to do a scalar times a vector, well, you just multiply that scalar into each of the entries. And again, the way you should think of this is, oh, okay, I'm taking that vector v and I'm stretching it by a factor of c, okay? If c is three, then I'm making that vector three times as long. Okay, maybe you can't quite visualize this because maybe it's a vector with seven entries, maybe it lives in seven dimensional space, but hopefully you have some idea of what that means. Like you're, you're stretching this high dimensional object. Okay, and algebraically, it's just, it's dead simple. It's exactly what we did in lower dimensions. Alrighty, so uh, because in these higher dimensional spaces, we're not just gonna be able to picture things and say, oh yeah, when we do this, this happens. It's gonna be really, really important that we're comfortable working with these things algebraically and that we're precise when we work with these things algebraically. Okay, so what we're gonna do in this course is whenever we introduce a new operation, we're gonna have a theorem that tells us how that operation works, what nice properties it has, okay? And so far in this course, we've introduced two operations. We've introduced vector addition, okay? And we also introduced scalar multiplication. We, we you know, how, how do you multiply a vector by a scalar? Okay, so we're gonna take a little detour now and we're gonna talk about what properties those two operations have, okay? And what I mean by properties are, for example, when you add two real numbers, you know that it doesn't matter the, the order in which you add those two numbers, right? If you do two plus five, you get the same thing as five plus two. Okay, that is a property of real number addition, okay? And well, one of the first things that we're gonna prove here is that the same property is true for vector addition, okay? If you take two vectors, it doesn't matter the order that you add them up in, okay? V plus W is the same as W plus V. And we're gonna prove this. We're gonna sort of write down precisely where this property comes from. Okay, and I'll talk a little bit more in a minute about why it's important to do this sort of thing. But for now, let's look at these properties that vector addition and scalar multiplication have, okay? And none of these are meant to be surprising, okay? Most of these, when you look at them, you're gonna say, oh yeah, okay, that's true, okay? But the point is we wanna sort of pin down why they're true. We wanna be precise in this course, okay? So yeah, I already talked about V plus W is the same as W plus V, so order doesn't matter in vector addition. And order doesn't matter in another sense as well. If you add up three vectors, it doesn't matter if you add up the first two first and then the other one, or if you add up the second two and then, you know, add the first one to it. In other words, you can group parentheses however you like. Okay, so the first property that we talked about here, this is something called commutativity, okay? If you, if you do something to two things and it doesn't matter the order you do it, that then the operation is called commutative. 
And the second property, if you can group things however you like, right, if you can throw in parentheses without affecting the result, that property is called associativity. And I mean, real number addition have both of these properties, and hopefully you're very comfortable with those properties for real number addition, but they're true for vector addition as well. All right. These next two properties, so properties C and D, these are both called distributivity, okay? And they describe a relationship between scalar multiplication and vector addition. Okay, and this first one says, well, if I do a number times a sum, right? So if I do scalar multiple of a vector sum, then I get the same thing as if I do scalar times first vector plus scalar times second vector. And again, the intuition here just comes from things that you know about real numbers, right? If you do A times B plus C, where those are all numbers, then yeah, you know that, oh, that's a times b plus a times c, right? You can sort of split up that sum. You can distribute terms when you multiply parentheses together, okay? The same thing's true for vectors, okay? As long as, you know, it's scalar multiplication, we don't have a vector times vector multiplication, okay? And same thing is true if the sum is on scalars. Again, you can distribute, okay? So hopefully those properties aren't surprising. Remember last class, we also talked about the zero vector. Zero vector is the vector that has every entry equal to zero. Okay, and this property just says, well, if you add that to another vector, you don't change that other vector. Again, if you think about the definition of vector addition, that shouldn't be surprising because you're just adding zero in each entry of that vector. If you take a vector and add its negative, you're gonna get the zero vector. Again, should not be surprising, right? I mean, this negative vector is just the vector that if you get, you get if you stick a minus sign in front of each of its entries. All right, this last property, it's just telling you that you can sort of regroup things. It's, it's kind of like another version of associativity, but for scalar multiplication now, if you do a scalar D times V and then times the scalar C, well, that's the same thing as just multiplying the scalars together and then times V. Okay, so none of these should be surprising. They all just come from the definitions very, very quickly, but let's see how we would actually prove one of these properties, okay? Let's see how we would pin it down precisely. And the idea is, we leech off of things that we already know, okay? So in this case, the things we already know are properties of real numbers, okay? We know that real number addition is commutative, for example. So we can leech off of that. We can use that to help us prove these properties, okay? So we're gonna go through a proof of property A here. We're gonna go through a proof of uh, commutativity for vector addition. All right, let's see where that comes from. And the proofs of the other properties, they're all very similar, okay? All of them are just, you write down the definition, you use the corresponding property of real numbers, and then you sort of tie things together. So let's see how it works. Let's go through property A though. Okay, we wanna show that V plus W is the same as W plus V, okay? So our first step is we're gonna give names to the entries of V and W, and we just do this in the standard way. I'm gonna call the first entry of V, V1, the next entry V2, and so on up to VN. And similarly for W, W1 is the first entry of W, up to WN is the last entry of W, okay? And the reason I do that is because I wanna leech off of um, properties of real numbers. So I wanna work in the entries of these two vectors. All right, so how do I prove that V plus W is the same as W plus V? Well, I'm gonna have to use the definition of vector addition, right? If you wanna prove something about an operation, you gotta use the definition of that operation somewhere. So let's start off with that. What is V plus W? Well, it's V1 plus W1 v2 plus w2, and so on down the line, okay? It's just the thing, the thing that you get if you add up these two vectors entry-wise. Okay, and I wanna show that this is the same as w plus v, so really all this amounts to is I wanna swap the v's and w's in each of these entries here. I wanna interchange v1 with w1, I wanna interchange v2 with w2, and so on down the line. Okay, but that's the thing I can do, that's true. Okay, and the reason for that is because addition of real numbers is commutative. So I know that V1 plus W1, yeah, that does equal W1 plus V1. And V2 plus W2, that does equal W2 plus V2. I can swap the order of all of these sums without changing the actual value of the sum. Okay, because of properties I know about real numbers. Okay, and now I just basically do this step again. Again, I use definition of vector addition. I just look at this and say, oh, well, that's just by definition, W plus V. Okay, so that's it. That's the whole proof. Now I've shown that V plus W, well, it equals this, which equals this, which equals what I wanted it to equal. I've shown that it actually does equal W plus V. Okay, so it's just the definition and then sort of other pieces of logic in the middle tying things together, okay? And this proof right here I mean, this is probably what was going on in your head when you looked at this property A of this theorem and said, oh, well, that's obvious. 
okay? Because you probably looked at this and said, okay, V plus W equals W plus V. Well, of course it does. I'm just doing real number addition a bunch of times and real number addition is commutative. I can swap those. Okay, maybe you didn't think that in as many words, but that was probably the thought process that was going on in your head. And here, we've just sort of written it down precisely. We've sort of clarified why it's true. Okay, well, I mean, real num or vector addition is just a bunch of real number additions, and I can swap all of those real number additions, and then that equals vector addition. Okay, we've just sort of made things precise. We've sort of written down that train of thought in mathematical notation. Okay, and all of the other properties of that theorem you can prove in a similar way. You just use the definition and then properties of real numbers and rinse and repeat. Okay, so we're only gonna go through property A explicitly here. All right, so why did we go through that theorem on the previous page? None of the properties of that theorem were surprising. Nothing there was really new in a sense. Like if I didn't show you that theorem and ask you, hey, does V plus W equal W plus V? You would have probably said, yeah. Okay, you didn't need that theorem to, to tell you that. You knew that anyway. So why did we go through it? And the point is, as we go through this course, we're gonna be introducing more and more operations and their properties are gonna get less and less obvious. So we're gonna to have to be really careful in this course to not accidentally say, oh yeah, well, I can swap the order of things in this operation, because that's not always gonna be true. In other words, we're gonna introduce operations that are not commutative. So we're gonna to have to be really, really careful not to just assume that uh, these operations we introduce have nice properties, okay? And also, it's, it's really, easy to become overly confident with these new operations, okay? So for example, we've already written down expressions like this one. In, in the previous example, we went through sort of, um, you know, this example where it was a hexagon and we were adding up six vectors pointing to, to corners of this hexagon. And when we did that, we didn't specify what order we were adding them up or how to group parentheses or anything like that. And that was a little careless because at that point, we didn't know that we were free to add them up in any order that we wanted. But now, thanks to this theorem, we do know that. We know that, okay, if you're adding up a whole bunch of vectors, just add them up in whatever order you like. You're always going to get the same answer because of commutativity and associativity. In particular, before that theorem, we didn't actually know that expressions like this one even made sense. V plus W plus X, what does that mean? Does that mean I do, you know, V plus W and then plus X? Or does that mean I do W plus X and then add V on to the left of it? Okay, Wh which one of those is it? Well, Thanks to associativity, it doesn't matter. You can add up, up in any order you like. So expressions like this actually make sense in the first place. Okay, another way to think about it is that theorem tells us that we can do algebra with vectors more or less how we would expect, okay? We have to be a little bit careful, but you know, if you're given some addition and scalar multiplications involving vectors, you can simplify them. You can simplify those expressions and factor things sort of how you're used to with real numbers. So let's go through an example here. Let's simplify this expression v plus two times w minus v minus three times v plus two w. Okay, and the way you do this, well, thanks to that previous theorem, we can distribute out the brackets and we can collect type like terms and do all those things that we're used to doing with real numbers. So in a sense, nothing changes. Okay, so here I just copied down that expression from up above. And then what I'm going to do first is I'm going to expand out these brackets, right? I'm going to get a 2w minus 2v. So 2w minus 2v when I expand out that first bracket and minus 3v and then minus 6w when I expand out those two terms there. Okay, next I can collect like terms. I got a bunch of v's, a bunch of v's, a bunch of v's. I can collect those and I got a bunch of w's and a bunch of w's. I can collect those. And after I do that, I'm going to get minus 4v minus 4w, okay? And that's a fine and dandy final answer, okay? That's sort of as simple as we can get. Some people like to factor a little bit at the end as well. So you could do this optional last step if you liked. You could factor out, I mean, there's a minus four here and a minus four there. So you could factor that out in front and that's a fine thing to do. I wouldn't say it's necessary, but it's fine, okay? So, I mean, that previous theorem told us that all of the steps that we did here are actually valid. Yes, you can distribute. Yes, you can factor. Yes, you can collect like terms. Yes, you can add in any order you like. So, I can swap these, uh, the order of the sums here if I like. Okay. One thing to be careful, though, is you only, only, only want to do vector addition and scalar multiplication. Those are the only two operations that we've actually defined on vectors here. Okay, so, if you're simplifying an expression like this, and at some point you feel the urge to multiply two vectors together to try to simplify things, something has gone haywire. That's not a thing, okay? Do not multiply vectors together. Similarly, if, if you say, oh, well, I want to cancel out the v's here, so I'm going to divide by the vector v. It, don't do that. That's not a thing, okay? Vector division is not a thing, 
Okay, you can add vectors, you can scale or multiply vectors, and therefore you can subtract vectors as well. And you can divide by scalars, right? Dividing by a scalar is just, you know, also scalar multiplication. Dividing by three is the same as multiplying by one third. Okay, so you can divide by scalars as well, but you cannot multiply or divide by vectors. So be careful of that. If you ever get the urge to multiply or divide by a vector, then something's gone wrong and you're not actually doing what it is you think you're doing. All right, so that'll do it for today's lecture. I will see you soon for lecture three.